Hi there, I'm Pastor Richard, and I want to welcome you back to our study, The Good News, a study in the book of Romans. Today, we'll primarily focus on chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. I want to consider the question, Abraham's faith, too good to be true? <laughs> I remember that soon after Joyce and I were married, we began to be somewhat bombarded by people we hardly knew or didn't know at all who wanted to make our life better with their product. They were offering something we needed, whether it was a universal life insurance policy or a kitchen countertop water filter or that high-powered vacuum cleaner that could lift a bowling ball with its powerful suction. All of them promised to resolve huge problems in our lives. As we got a little older, it changed to special invites for us to come and tour timeshare properties with the promise of some great gift if we would come and check it out. There was always a catch. Certainly nothing offered as a gift was truly free. And the product they were offering to provide us rest and relaxation, uh, we just simply couldn't afford it. Never once over all the years has someone offered us a serious solution to one of our problem without serious effort and expense required on our part. It's easy with all the conditions that are applied, combined with the high price tags on those great problem solvers, it's easy for us to become skeptical about gifts and cynical about the givers. Because of all this, the idea of a wonderful solution to an awful problem being offered completely as a, ge a, a gift, well, it's almost unheard of especially in the world of religion, or as we call it these days, faith, where there is most always a list of things we need to do to have our problem of sin solved. The idea that genuine faith is based truly on a gift, quite honestly, seems for most too good to be true. The fact is God offers us wonderful, genuine good news. Initially, it might appear <laughs> too good to be true. The Apostle Paul, in his introductory words in chapter 1, told the readers in Rome, which included both Jews and Gentiles, that he was ready to preach or proclaim or herald the gospel, the good news to them. He was committed and excited to shamelessly present the genuine solution to their and our greatest problem, our sin problem, and the eternal horrible consequences that come with that problem. Paul would present that good news solution to anyone who would believe. He said to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He discovered early on that the Jews particularly found this unique good news message hard to believe. They had always understood that, that righteousness or being right with God would come to them by their obedience to the law, doing good works, and by their national identity as a people of God through physical circumcision. Paul has just appealed to them in verse 21 of chapter 3, where it says, but now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. The Jewish Christians in Rome would have been very skeptical of this new doctrine. And so most likely they asked Paul, how does this doctrine of justification by faith relate to our history? Paul, you say this doctrine is witnessed to by the law and the prophets. Well, what about our father Abraham? 
I think Paul here has accepted the challenge and in this fourth chapter explains how Abraham was saved. Notice in verse 1, What shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? See, when he calls Abraham our forefather, he's referring primarily to the Jews as natural, physical descendants from Abraham. But if you look down in verse 11, you'll notice something very interesting. Abraham is called the father of all who believe, meaning all who have trusted in Christ. In Abraham, we have an Old Testament model of justification by faith. Faith that saves us. Saving faith. God's plan to save us from our sins has from the very beginning been God's plan for our salvation. It's salvation by faith. Saving faith is our sin solution. I want us just to note three very simple realities, uh, marks of genuine saving faith from these verses. Notice, first of all, in verse 2, saving faith's boast. For if Abraham, the scripture says, was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. You see, God's solution for our sin problem is all his doing, not ours. If Abraham could have earned his forgiveness of sin through, through works, he would have had a reason to boast in what he had accomplished. Man can boast about his good works, but it doesn't mean anything before a perfectly holy God. You go up a few verses in chapter 3, Paul asks this question, can we boast then that we've done anything to be accepted by God? No, <laughs> because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It is based squarely on faith. In God's plan for solving our sin problem, any possible boasting on our part is excluded. God gets all the glory and credit, and he deserves it. Paul told the Ephesians, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and that is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God not a result of works, so that no one may boast. You see, savings faith boast, <laughs> it's excluded. In God's plan of saving man, he gets all the credit. I want you to notice secondly about this unique faith, Bible faith, saving faith, the bases of that faith in verses 3 to 5. For what does the scripture say? <laughs> The first basis of saving faith begins with the Scripture, the Word of God. In Genesis 15, the Scripture records God directly speaking to Abraham to address the thing that Abraham wanted most. He wanted a son. He wanted an heir. And God had promised him a son, but as yet, that promise had not been fulfilled. It was then that God told him to look up, look at the stars. God told him, so shall your descendants be. Abraham had God's word, and Abraham heard God's word. The scripture tells us faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of God. And then there's the basis of saving faith, not just having hear, heard the word of God, but also believing the word of God. God promised, and Abraham believed God's promise. Verse 3 says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. The Hebrew word translated believed means to say, amen. God gave a promise, 
And Abraham responded with, Amen. It was this faith that was then counted for righteousness. So what does that word counted mean? Well, here in verse 3, the Greek word means literally to put to one's account. It's a banking term. The same word is used 11 times in this chapter and appears in other translation and translated words like reckoned or imputed. Verse 4 says, Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Here's what it means. When a person works, they earn their salary. And their money is put into their account. But Abraham did not work for his salvation. Keeping the law was not his salvation. Abraham simply heard God's word and believed God long before the law was even written. He was saved. Well, long before circumcision, Jesus Christ would do for Abraham on the cross what he offers for all of us to give us his righteousness. He applied that righteousness to Abraham's account. It's like kind of like this on a ledger with two columns. You have income and expenditures. <laughs> the numbers in our lives do not match up. We could never pay the expenses of our sinfulness. Jesus stepped in and brought reconciliation. He made things right. Only he can balance the books and grant us eternal life through the forgiveness of sins. It's all his doing. We must trust him. This speaks to the third and final element of saving faith, and that is the blessings of saving faith. Verse 5 makes the astounding statement, God justifies the ungodly. You see, the Old Testament pattern was opposite. It went something like this, justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. But here in our text today, almost too good to be true, God justifies the ungodly. And that's simply because there are no godly people to justify. He put our sins on Christ's account that we might put Christ's righteousness on our account. And then there's a second added blessing mentioned here in verses 6 to 8. Verse 6 says, Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Paul here is quoting from one of David's psalms of confession to assure us that God not only forgives sins and makes us legally righteous, but also that God does not impute our sins. In other words, once we are justified, our record contains Christ's perfect righteousness. And those sins can never be brought up again. As Christians, we still battle with sin. And when we sin, 1 John 1 says that we're to confess it to God. And He's faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us that we might have an unhindered and blessed fellowship with Him. These sins are not held against us. By faith... We've been justified, legally made righteous in God's sight. So the begs the question, how should we respond to what we've heard in the text today? Well, in Scripture, we're encouraged to examine ourselves to see if we are in the faith. 
Have you ever come to the point of understanding and admitting before God that you could never do enough to meet God's standard for salvation? That standard is perfect righteousness. Have you ever reached out in biblical faith, saving faith, and asked God for His righteousness, His perfection, to be applied to your account? If you've never made that important faith decision, I encourage you, do it today. Perhaps you might share that need with someone in your group today. I'm sure they would love to help you make that important decision today. Secondly, let me encourage you who've already made that decision, walk in the peace God provides. Don't beat yourself up when you sin. Don't despair and throw in the towel. Recognize your sin, confess it to God, and live in the peace that he's already provided for you in Jesus and his righteousness. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Let's not be cynical. Let's not be skeptical. Let's take God at his word. Trust him. Walk in his righteousness, in victory, and be at peace.